Today we have Lunch and Learn. This is our July edition with our speaker, Jenna Amacher, and she's also brought Francis Arthur with her. Uh, who's going to talk today about why should I vote. Um, this program will be nonpartisan in, in its entirety, and um, but it, I think it's important to know, especially this time of year with an election right around the corner, uh, primaries going on right now, it's a uh, it's a very important topic, and I was really hoping to get some more young people here that may be first-time voters or people who just registered that are more familiar with the process. But I understand we're going to be live streaming it, and we're also filming it for LightTube here, so the information is still going to get out no matter what. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker today, Jenna Amak. Hello, guys. Um, I'm Jenna Amaker. Um so there's a twofold reason for why I wanted to do this. Uh, the main reason being it is election season. I primarily have been a high school teacher um, over the past 10 years. I also have a law degree, um, but I've done a lot of different things. But my biggest passion is for education. And we should be lifelong learners. So just plain and simple, we should never stop trying to learn something new. Um, I feel like civics is something that has fell by the wayside and we don't teach it in school like we used to. And I just feel like we gotta bring that passion back and maybe my generation, they didn't learn it like they should have. So we can all stand to learn something new or just be reminded of something maybe we have just forgotten. So why should I vote? First of all, I do believe that we should have a passion for where we live. The United States of America is a great and wondrous place to live. And I believe that we should start off today by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And we're going to talk about that pledge for just a minute. So if you would please stand with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so with that said, the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance, just the term allegiance. We should all be America first. I mean, I don't feel like whether you are a Republican or Democrat or non, if you are a Libertarian or if you're an Independent, this is your home. We've got to take care of it. And so we owe an allegiance to that flag, we own allegiance to this country. Um, in the middle of that, I'm sure you heard the words, and to the Republic. Uh, many people, especially my generation, don't understand what that actually means. So what is a Republic? It's not a democracy. It is a modified form of a democratic regime, okay, where the majority rules. But it actually is set up so that we have representatives constitutionally who represent our interests. And there's meant to be some changeover in that representation to ensure that we don't create a system of elitism or go back to a dictatorship or a monarchy or, or whatever that may be, if you will. So there was one guy who really had the philosophy behind this, and his name was Aristotle. Okay? Better known as the father of political science, the father of democracy, um, he, the father of government. He was a Greek philosopher who lived uh, between 384 and 322 BC, and he was a student of Plato and a teacher of Alexander the Great. A very smart and intellectual individual. He made significant and lasting contributions to nearly every aspect of human knowledge, from logic to biology to ethics and aesthetics. In Arabic philosophy, he was known simply as the first teacher. In the West, he was the philosopher. So me being so passionate about education, Aristotle is kind of my teacher hero. So, since he was the father of government, he had already kind of delved into this whole idea of democracy. But Aristotle didn't like pure democracy. He wanted a constitution. He wanted it to be a republic. And so he was the first constitutionalist to have ever walked the earth, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And though he likes majority rule, he loathes this idea of democracy. This idea that everybody gets a say, everybody gets a vote. Why? Why would he hate that idea? Well, 
Because if you really think about it, for that idea to truly work, you'd have to have two things for it to last. And those two things are an educated electorate and an unbiased media. So an educated electorate, realistically, does everybody know everything that maybe they should know when they go to the polls? Not just about the candidates, but about the process, about the party's platforms, about the intent, about the practical implications of said intent. Sure, Obamacare sound, sounded wonderful, but I don't think anybody's arguing the fact that there have been some issues. Maybe it was a good idea, and the whole principle of let's, everybody, let's make sure everybody has health care is a good thing. I think we can all agree on that. But with the inflated cost of said health care and the drain that it has taken and the toll that it has taken on the economy, did we really think past further than this is a great idea? So we really have to be educated and think down the line um, and, and what we're doing and how that's going to affect uh, different things in the future. So I think it's safe to say that unfortunately we don't have an educated electorate. We also don't have much of an electorate. There are 54,000 people in Coffee County. There are 33,000 roughly registered voters. In the last election in 2016 that I looked at, there were roughly about 9,000 people who cast a vote. It wasn't much higher than that in 2014. There was just above 10,000 people. So you have 10,000 people in this county expressing their wishes and controlling what happens and who's in those offices for 54,000 people. So 20% are deciding for the majority. Unbiased media. This is an interesting concept because if you think about 384 BC, what was an unbiased media, right? Do they even have media in 384 BC? But media can just simply be word of mouth. So you're talking to so-and-so and they're talking to so-and-so and they're talking to so-and-so. And what's being said about said individual or, or said law or said rule that it may be implemented um, has a lot to do with how the public perception uh, is perceived about that person or that rule. And so we know with social media now, there's a lot of things that fly around that aren't necessarily true. And now we also know that, you know, people begin to believe, we believe what we see. We do. So you can tell somebody something all day long, but if they see something different with their eyes, there's something to be said for that. I want everybody to uh, do this for me. Up in there, just bear with me. Everybody's got to look at me to do it. Daniel Barry, I need you. Okay, so take this. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to place this on your chin. How many of you went to your cheek? <laughs> we do what we see, not what we're told. Okay, so print media is so crucial. And so, we have to understand that, that people can be swayed so easily by what they see. Educated electorate and an unbiased media. I don't think anybody is even arguing Fox News is too conservative. MSNBC MSA, and ABC are too liberal, okay? So do we have an unbiased media? Is every newspaper actually printing just the facts objectively? Or has everybody got a subjective interpretation of what is actually taking place? And how is that affecting our voters and how they vote? So, Aristotle said democracy was doomed. So when our founding fathers were at the Constitutional Convention, they actually talked about some of these Greek philosophers. And they said, you know what? I think he had a point. We don't need a pure form of democracy. We need something that's going to be everlasting and that we can keep, right? So, doing democracy, not today. Our founding fathers did their homework and they gave us this constitutional republic. And I think that we have spilled the milk over a little bit at times, um, but hopefully we clean up our messes and we get back on track, right? Uh, so, we're like children trying to learn from the expertise of those fathers. Aristotle's theory of the evolution of government. 
He also said that, you know what? You may end up with one type of regime, but be very careful. There is no regime in existence today in any type of government, in any land, that is the same exact regime as it was when you first started. So, let's say you start out with a monarchy, a dictatorship, the rule of one. Well, what happens? Well, you gotta have the buddy system then. If you wanna stay in that position, you're gonna have to start doing some favors for a few other people. And as those people rise through the ranks, well, now it's not really just the influence of one, it's the influence of a few, or the elitists. So now we've automatically, without a change in like, everybody voting to change it, or saying out loud, hey, we're gonna change this, we've evolved into an oligarchy. Um, still we have a dictator, but we're ruled by this circle of people. Congress, anyone? Democracy. So maybe we have this oligarchy and this rule of many elitists, and, and eventually the people get tired of it, and they revolt. And we have this revolution, and we say, I'm tired of being oppressed by the few people, and this has happened over time in history in many different regimes, and they throw them and they oust them out of office, whether by votes or whether by warfare. And then we're left with democracy, because now the people have the rule, but the problem with democracy is it's chaotic. Who's really in charge? Is anything gonna get done? It's basically anarchy. We're back to Wild Wild West. So that doesn't work. So we look to somebody who has a passion for public speaking, who is charismatic, who carries themselves so well. And we say, you, you lead. I trust you. Uh, but be careful because we are so inept to being greedy and powerful and it goes to our heads that without having a check and a balance without having those separation of powers we're going to be right back to where we started the question i pose to you today my friends is where are we as the united states in this process so at the close of the constitutional convention as written by dr james McHenry in 1787 Benjamin Franklin was walking down the steps, and a lady turned to him and she said, well, doctor, what have we got? Did we end up with a republic or a monarchy? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. It is so crucial that we have an educated electorate, even though we don't have a pure democratic regime. We have a constitutional republic, and we have to be engaged in the process in order to keep it. And it's so important that we express this to our young people. So I'm going to, this is just some notes I put up here. I pulled this from somewhere else because I didn't want to discuss the parties, but I didn't want it to come from my words. So basically, we have uh, basically a two-party formal system in the United States right now who you know to be the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. So I'm just going to read a few things off of this that kind of summarize these two things. Um, Democratic Party is one of two major political parties in the United States, founded in 1828 by Andrew Jackson. It is the oldest voter-based political party in the world. Um, however, the Democratic Party, and this is so crucial, at its founding supported a completely different set of issues than it presently supports. From its founding until the mid 20th century, the Democratic Party was the dominant party among white Southerners, and as such, when the party most associated with the defense of slavery. However, following the Great Society under Lyndon B. Johnson, the Democratic Party became the more progressive party on the issues of civil rights while losing dominance in the Southern states to the Republicans. The Democratic Party since 1912 has positioned itself as the Liberal Party on domestic issues. The economic philosophy of FDR, which is why we had so many people who came back to the Democratic Party after FDR, um, has strongly influenced modern American liberalism and has shaped much of the party's agenda since 1932. The New Deal Coalition controlled the White House until 1968, with the exception of two terms under President Eisenhower. So since the mid-20th century, Democrats have generally been the center left and currently support social justice, social liberalism, a mixed economy, a welfare state, and they have pushed for free trade and neoliberalism, a few people like Bill Clinton, um, which has seemed to have shifted the party a little bit back towards the right. Um, but as we can see, we tend to fluctuate um, whether in one party or another. 
Uh, currently, the Democratic Party is declining in its voter base, as we have seen over the past few elections. Um, a Green Party, this is another, this is probably the third, I think it is the third party, um, the fourth largest party in the United States, Libertarian being the third, and I'll get to it. Um, basically, it got public attention during Ralph Nader's second, second presidential run in 2000. Uh, the Green Party in the United States stands for environmentalism, uh, a non-hierarchical participatory democracy, social, ju social justice, diversity, peace, and nonviolence. As of 2016, it is the fourth largest organized political party in the United States. Uh, the Constitution Party, this is the fifth largest. It is a small national right-wing political party, so we're going back the other way. Um, it's strongly pro-life, supports gun rights, restrictions on immigration, and it calls for protectionist trade policies. So constitutionalists, you may, they may remind you more of like the Tea Party, because many of the Tea Party goers are in fact uh, a member of this Constitution Party. Uh, the Republican Party, this is the other major contemporary political party in the United States. It was founded in 1854 by northern anti-slavery activists and modernizers. The Republican Party rose to prominence in 1860 with the election of Abraham Lincoln, who used the party machinery to support victory in the American Civil War. Uh, the GOP dominated national politics during the third party system from 1854 to 1896 and fourth party system from 1896 to 1932. So since its founding, the Republican Party has been the more market oriented of the two American political parties, often favoring policies that aid American business interests, pro-capitalism. That sums up a lot of the platform of the Republican Party. Um, today, the Republican Party supports an American conservative platform with further foundations in economic, economic liberalism, actually, uh, fiscal conservatism, and social conservatism. The Republican Party tends to be stronger in the southern United States and the flyover states, and it has gained no notoriety from evangelical Christians, so it has become their party of choice. The Libertarian Party, founded December 11th, 1971. It is the third largest party out of all of the five I have discussed. Um, the Libertarian Party's core mission is to reduce the size, influence, and expenditures of all levels of government. To this effect, the party supports minimally regulated markets, a less powerful federal government, strong civil liberties, drug liberalism, <coughs> separation of church and state, open immigration, non-interventionism, and neutrality in diplomatic relations, free trade, and free movement to all foreign countries. So basically, fiscally, the Libertarian Party is very close in line with some of the capitalist trade pol policies of the Republican Party. However, um, they are anti-tax. That is basically their number one thing that they disagree with is anti-tax. However, on social issues, they tend to be a little bit more liberal, okay? Because the libertarians just basically want the government to take a step back, get out of our daily lives, but to what extent may be a little bit extreme for some of us, okay? Let's be honest. We need government because we talked about what it would be like not to have government and to have this ever-changing regime. Okay, government does a lot of great things for us. In fact, the government is supporting right now hosting this event, Telehoma Parks and Recreation, to inform you, public school systems. These are things that we need, infrastructure, roads. We need government and we need taxes and we need to have an allegiance to the United States to take care of those things, okay? Um, at, on the other hand, is the government there to employ us all or to take care of us or um, to be so big that they are actually a for-profit entity. Well, it just kind of depends on your views of the government's role in your life and how you perceive that they should either take a step back or be front and center. So, basically the further, this is kind of a diagram of current philosophy of the evolution of government. Okay. So many people think that it's a line because we say, oh, far right or oh, far left. It's not a line. It is a circle. And the further you go one way, it starts to resemble that of the other as far as extreme oppressive regimes where the government has all control. 
aka fascism and communism. So the more you go to the left, the bigger and more centralized the government becomes, more taxes, more laws, more regulations, all the way down to where the government is all in charge in a communist state, okay? The further you go around to the right, the smaller the government, although you may end up with just one guy in charge once you get all the way around, okay? Um, more states' rights, uh, less taxes, less regulations, and less laws. But can there be too little? Can one person hold too much power when there, in fact, is too little of a government overall, a.k.a. fascism? So maybe, here's the bigger difference that I see. One party, one side, wants you to have equality. Actually, both sides want you to have equality. But where do you start with that equality? Do you have it in the beginning, equality in the beginning? Or do you have equality in the end? Perhaps equality in the beginning and fascism is really at an extreme level. Let's make everybody look the same, okay? And perhaps equality in the end is a very extreme level on the other hand with communism. Let's make sure everybody has very little and the government holds it all. That way there is equality among the people, aka redistributing the wealth. So would you rather have equality in the beginning or equality in the end? Um, I'm going to zoom out where you can kind of see this. So. There are great Democrats in this country who have accomplished a lot, and there are great Republicans in this country who have accomplished a lot. And I think that the point of this is, is how we keep our constitutional republic is if we stay up here at the top, it's kind of like a ball. You know, if you can like keep the ball at the top instead of making it roll down the street, you know, you kind of tear harder back here and you have balance. And so it creates that balance. So whether we have, you know, we have a few Democrats in office, a few Republicans, we get to keep that. And we get to balance those interests of, yes, we need taxes, get over it, anarchists. Or, hey, you know what, I believe that maybe there's some waste going on over here, and maybe you don't need that much, okay? And so we balance each other out in the interests that we need. So the further we go around right, and the further we go around left, there is a point of no return. The pendulum can swing too far. We all know that once you get to socialism, it is but a matter of time that that will eventually become communism. You cannot stop it. Once it got past that point, it's going to keep rolling. You can't stop it. So the evolution of the regime will happen if we don't keep the balance at the top. So talking about Democrats and Republicans, um, that's why as you go left, you kind of go around. Uh, a well-known Democrat might be somebody like Bill Clinton, okay? A progressive, Hillary Clinton, Obama. They are, are outspokenly that they are progressives. Um, Democratic Socialists, there was a guy who ran for president in uh, the Democratic primary this last election. Who, who might that be? Bernie Sanders, thank you. Who else was a Democratic Socialist in history? Wasn't in this country. Joseph Stalin. Socialism. We all know that that democratic socialist, Joseph Stalin, ended up creating a socialist regime, but then eventually had to force his way um, with the Iron Curtain into communism. Okay, and uh, was probably is probably now considered one of the greatest mass murderers of that century. Dangerous territory the further we go around. Also, if we think about Hitler and the fascist regime, fascism, how dangerous that can be, right? Equality, to what extent? That's crazy, okay? So the further we go in the radical right or the radical left, the more dangerous that territory becomes. Our safe zone is up here. And so... As we look at this, I just hope it gives you kind of a, an overview of, hey, it's okay to vote for whatever party you're with. Let's look at their values and their platforms. Are they too far right? Are they too far left? What, what do they believe in? You really have to look at individual principles and values to make the most informed and educated decisions.
And that is my presentation. So what I'm going to do now is introduce the next speaker, who is Miss Frances Author. She served on the uh, Republican State Executive Committee since 2014. She is our current State Executive Committee woman. Um, she teaches homeschool tutorial. Uh, she teaches at a homeschool tutorial in Murfreesboro. Uh, she teaches government, economics, American history, and civics. Her passion is to teach. Uh, she is now the named the Tennessee Teen Eagle Leader. Uh, well, she's been that since 2011. And teaches students across Tennessee government, uh, across Tennessee government, civics, and current events, and how they can influence the outcome of an election. Um, and earlier this year, she was. Uh, appointed as National Teen Eagle Chairman for the Eagle Forum. She has a husband, Dale, and two sons serving in the military, one soldier and um, one Marine. So please welcome Ms. Frances Author. Thank you. Thank you. Give me just a second to, as I run and get back to the other. I'm sorry? She introduced you as part of a thing called Eagle. Eagle Forum? What is that? Eagle Forum is an organization that was founded by Phyllis Schlafly in 1970, in the early 1970s. It's a pro-family organization, and they lobby in uh, both states and at the federal level for issues that are important to families. So pro-choice also? Uh, no, they are a pro-life organization, and... So it's not balanced. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very conservative organization. Okay, and so I work with the teenagers in that group, and if you had asked me 20 years ago if I wanted to work with teenagers, I'd have said, no, you've lost your mind. So don't want to have anything to do with teenagers, and then God gave me two of them and uh, that lived in my house for my sons, and I decided that I liked teenagers. And now I, I just can't even wait for the opportunity to get to see my students again. It's, it's a lot of fun for me to get to work with teens. So I'm going to talk to you today about the upcoming election cycle, and uh, we're, you know, we're in the middle of early voting right now. The state constitution in Tennessee, in Article 1, Section 5, says that in Tennessee we have to have elections and they shall be fair and free. Free and equal elections. Why? Why do we need free and equal elections? Hmm. Okay, I can't get it. I can't get it. to work. Okay. Uh, Ronald Reagan gave us a warning. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. If we didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream, it must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. My kids didn't grow up knowing to vote. They weren't born knowing how to vote. But they do now because I taught it to them. Voting is one of the freedoms that we have in this country. It's one of the freedoms they got in Iraq a few years ago after we toppled a despotic regime. And those ladies understand that voting is not just a, a right, it's a responsibility. They wanted to go vote. It amazes me that in Iraq in that election, after an entire generation of Iraqis had never gotten to vote, they had a 99% voter turnout. And what did Jenna say our voter turnout's gonna be this time? That's dismal. 10%, a 10% voting block is gonna determine what the rest of the 90% are gonna do. They got it. 99% voter turnout. So who are you voting for? Why are you voting for? Jenna hinted a few minutes ago at the party platforms. A lot of people have no idea what candidates are on the ballot whenever they go this time. They see signs all over their community. They're sick to death of seeing the signs. I'm sick to death of seeing the signs too. But people just don't understand it. So we put the signs out everywhere hoping that whenever people go vote, they'll see your name somewhere and they'll vote for you because they saw your sign. Believe it or not, there are actually people in this county who count the number of signs that they see for a particular candidate on their way to the poll and they vote for that person. Oh, well, this one had better looking signs than that one did. And don't think the candidates don't think about that too. Or this one had more signs than that one did, so I'm voting for this one. Don't think people don't. In this election, you are going to have two different races that you're dealing with, or two different elections. The county general election 
and the state and federal primary elections. The easiest way I've ever thought of, of teaching this is with baseball. It makes sense to me. I like baseball. You know, we have the American League teams. We have the National League teams. And all during the season, they duke it out with each other, right? Okay, and then you get into the playoff series sometime in September, and the National League teams play off against each other. The American teams, League teams are playing off against each other, and they'll get to one championship team in both, both leagues. Then that one team from each league will come forward to the World Series. Yeah, that, that's in October, okay? So we have the playoffs, and then we get to the general election, and that's what this is this time. The general election is going to be for the county level seats. We already had their primary. It was back in the spring this year. You saw the signs then. They came out then. It's like the state animal during election years or little signs everywhere. It amazes me again how some people don't want to go vote in the local elections. Oh, that president's not running. Why do I need to go vote in this one? It doesn't matter. It's just the local. I'm dumbfounded at this. Think about what these people at the local level get to do. If I came to your house, knocked on your door and said, hi, I'm here to manage your money for you. I'll be taking over your bank account and I'm gonna write your checks. I'll make sure that your house note gets paid. You've got money for your gas tank. You can buy school clothes for your kids this fall. I'll take care of that. Would you let me? Of course not. Let me balance my own checkbook. You shouldn't let me do it. Okay, so that's what these guys do. You hand them money every time you go to the gas tank, they get gas tax money. Every time you go to the store and buy something, they get sales tax money. Whenever you write your check every year for your property taxes or if it comes out of your house payment every month, they get the money and it's their job to figure out where to spend it. These are the people who determine what your community looks like. If I were balancing your checkbook for you, I would be the person who determined what your house looks like, whether or not you even had one. These are the people who determine where you live. Are you really not going to vote for them now? I'm going to do more than just vote for them. I'm going to go meet them. I'm going to know who they are. I'm writing you a check for money every week. Every time I fill up at the, at the gas pump, I'm giving you my money. I want to know what you're going to do with it. Are my kids going to have schools that they can go to? Are they going to have good textbooks when they're there? Are the roads going to get paid? Is a traffic light going to get put up at that busy intersection? That's what these guys are doing. What about my police and fire and ambulance service? Are those getting paid for? That's what the county level leaders are doing. Darn right I'm going to know who they are and what they're doing with my money. Off of the CTAS website, I pulled this information. The county legislative body, that's your county commissioners. County legislative body has considerable discretion in dealing with the budget for all funds except the school budget, and that's dealt with by the school board, and then the county, uh, ex or the county commissioners have to approve that budget. The county legislative body sets a property tax rate, which along with the revenues from other county taxes and fees, as well as state and federal monies allocated to the county, are used to fund the budget. These are the people that decide where your money's going. And you, you're gonna stay at home and skip this one out because the president's not running for office? Seriously, the people at the local level will affect your day-to-day -day life far more than anything the president and Congress can do. They will not have nearly the direct effect on your day-to-day -day living as your county elected officials will. Think about that. That's fun stuff. Okay, so this is a general election again. That means whenever you go to vote, you're going to see one Republican candidate, one Democrat candidate, and any qualifying independent candidates on the county general or in the county general election. For example, in the county mayor's race, you will see three candidates' names. You'll see uh, Mayor Gary Cordell is the Republican, David Pennington is the Democrat, and Tim Brown is the independent. Those are your only three options. They've already had their playoff series, so this is their general election. In addition to voting for county mayor this time, you'll vote for county trustee, register of deeds, county clerk, county court clerk, and county commissioner according to your district in which you live within the county. Just for fun the other day, I did a Google search and 
What does a county commissioner do? What does a county clerk do? What does a county trustee do? I want, a, I want a job descriptions. That's where I found out the information about how much leverage a county commissioner has with my money. Can you tell them riled up about this? I mean, this concerns me. I want to know who these people are. That'd be a fun thing for you. I mean, you can look that up. I did. Okay, the next election you'll vote in is the federal and state primary. This is the one where you will have to declare a political party affiliation, either Republican or Democrat. Okay, so which party are you gonna, ooh, one, two, sorry. Uh, which party are you gonna affiliate with? Republican or Democrat or Green or Constitution? Can I just save you the trouble? Go look it up for yourself. Quit listening to all the rhetoric about it. I believe for the first 10 years that I was a voter, that I was affiliated with one party. You know why? Because my grandparents were in that party and my mama and daddy were in that party and I thought my finger would fall off my hand if I didn't vote for a candidate in that party. And then I went and read the party platforms and I found out what that party believed. And I thought, well, I don't believe that. Seriously, this is a Google search. Republican Party platform, Democrat Party platform, Green Party platform, and read what it says. These, these uh, platforms are determined by the party leaders. As John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So if you know what the leaders of a political party believe, as denoted in their party platform, then you can determine what the party elected official is gonna believe and determine whether or not that's the best vote for you. If that's someone for whom you should really cast a vote. Okay, on your ballot this time, you're going to see a gubernatorial candidate, a U.S. Senate candidate, U.S. House in Coffee County, we're in the Tennessee 6th District, uh, and you'll also see a Tennessee, remember I said federal government, those three at the top, uh, the state governor, the two at the middle, rather, governors, state, federal, or state primary, Tennessee House, we're in District 47, and then a state executive committee man and a committee woman. Okay, so you'll have your ballot, it'll look like this, it could say Democrat at the top if you want to vote for it in the Democratic primary, but it's basically the same thing because you'll have those six positions for whom you're casting a vote. The one that throws everybody off is the State Executive Committee. Hi, I'm Frances Arthur. I'm a State Executive Committee woman. <laughs> okay, let me explain this position to you. Both of the major political parties have a State Executive Committee that serves as their board of directors for their political party. The Republicans have theirs, the Democrats have theirs, and you vote for them in this election. They don't have a primary. This is their only election. These two groups will never meet with one another. The Republicans deal only with Republican issues in the state. The Democrats do the same. Only with the issues for their party. Like what? Well, one of my jobs on the SEC was to vote for a state party chairman. One of my jobs earlier this year, whenever we saw that we had two, uh, several candidates who wanted to run for the U.S. Senate seat, our party didn't feel like some of them actually were members of our party. We didn't feel like they had the voting requirements that they needed to meet in order to serve as a U.S. Senator. So we had their names removed from the ballot. If you don't like what's happening with your political party at the local or state level, these are the people you need to deal with. Be nice. We get paid nothing. It's a voluntary position. But you need to know who these people are, especially if you don't like the direction your party is headed, because they're the leaders who help determine that party platform. Make sure you know them. Don't just cast your vote. Make sure you know them. Okay, so there's your state executive committee. Ah, no, I'm really skipping forward quite a bit. Okay. Okay, so then do elections really matter? In 1960, and I wasn't born yet, <laughs> that's important to note, Kennedy and Nixon ran against each other for the presidency. It's a presidential race. Everybody shows up, right? No, not really. Not so many people showed up. I don't understand that, but they did. 
So in 1960, Kennedy defeated Nixon by 385,000 votes. There are approximately 172,000 precincts in the United States. That equates to 2.21 votes per precinct. Had three people in each precinct gone and voted for Nixon, he would have won in a landslide. What would that have done to our national history? Just think, just play with that for a minute. Would the Bay of Pigs invasion happen? Would the Cuban Missile Crisis have happened? Would Kennedy have been assassinated? Think about how the direction that our nation could have turned. Over three votes per precinct. Does your vote matter now? In 2016, two years ago, this is in our lifetimes, two years ago, in the Vermont House, this was the fourth matchup between Democrat Sarah Buxton and Republican David Ainsworth. The first time they had run against each other eight years prior, it, it had been decided by one vote also. So in 2016, the vote tally, 1,003, with the Democrat leading by three votes, 1,003 to 1,000. That calls for an automatic recount under the laws of Vermont. They recounted. And they both tied at a thousand. Makes you wonder if they know how to count there. Hmm. But a thousand apiece. So we have to recount the votes again. And during the second recount, Ainsworth won 1,004 to 1,003. Does one vote matter now? Buxton didn't appeal that time. So the Republican candidate went to the state house. Did one vote matter then? It did. One vote in that district of several precincts. <clears throat> wow. But that's in Vermont. Maybe they just don't know how to count votes in Vermont. Maybe that won't matter in Coffee County. Oh, but it did. In 2014, candidate uh, Lamar Wilkie, Republican Lamar Wilkie, ran against Democrat Missy DeFord in the Coffee County 14th County Commission District race. It was a dead tie. The first tie we've ever had in 178 years of Coffee County history. A tie, not a statistical tie, not close enough for a recount, a real live in your face tie. We had one provisional ballot. Somebody had voted absentee. So at the appointed time, they opened up the ballot and that voter voted for nobody in the race. So we still have a tie. <laughs> So what happens now? According to state law, it goes to our county commission. At the time, our county commission consisted of 11 Democrats, 10 Republicans. Guess who they voted for? And Missy DeFord now serves as the county commissioner for the 14th. And just so you know, there's no animus between these two former candidates. They both get along with each other and they stay in communication now so they can both play nicely with each other. But did one vote matter? You bet it did. You bet it did. Remember, these are the people who are dealing with your money and determining what our community looks like. Does your vote matter now? It does to that guy. Last week, I, I got a phone call from that guy. And he told me, Mom, I just got my, my absentee ballot in the mail. I wanted to go over some of these candidates with you and make sure I was voting for the right people. I hardly said a word. He had researched all of his candidates and he said, I just wanna make sure I'm voting for the right people. I'm voting for this person in this race and this one in that race. Sounds good, keep going. I'm in this race, I've got that one. It matters to him. Does it matter to you? Your one vote really does mean something. It matters to those ladies in Iraq. It matters to the soldiers fighting for our freedoms. But does it matter to you? Shame on you if you stay home and don't vote. People have fought and died for that opportunity. Thank you.